We return to Jay Diamond. I'm Shelley Strickler, WOR News. WOR presents a tribute to Barry Gray. There is that theme. And everybody's nonplussed. This is the tribute to Barry Gray. Ladies and gentlemen, from the age of four years old, really from the age I was first conscious, that voice was always in my home every night. My father could see me now. I think he'd, he'd get up, uh, probably walk around the block, and he's been gone for 22 years because Barry Gray was my father's idol, and Barry Gray was the man my grandfather listened to night after night after night. And I was talking to Bob Grant uh, two weeks ago, and I said, you know the great thing about Barry? Even if you're not interested in the specific subject he's addressing that night, even if you disagree with him, you want Barry Gray. You want the voice of Barry Gray keeping you company in that room. And that was his magic. It was beyond what he said. And what he said was grand. But it was the man's, that magnificent titanic voice bathing you in your own home, surrounding you in your own home, keeping you company, your companion in your own home. Barry Gray was your relative. He belonged in your home. That was his art. That was his magic. It was just a gift. People can go to broadcasting school, but they can never get the grace of God that enabled Barry Gray to be a champion, a legend of this business. Barry Gray invented talk radio. And so this is a difficult show for me and all of us here at WOR to conduct, but we do it out of a respect, a reverence, and a real love for the man we all admired our whole life, Barry Gray. I think we have Joan Hamburg on the line now. Is that right? Joan, are you there? Jay, yes. And not only I was listening to you talk about how you grew up with Barry, but from my high school years and college years on, he too was a voice in all of our lives. My mother used to hide the radio in the bathroom because my father wanted to go to bed, and she would sneak in to listen to Barry Gray. So whenever any of the kids would come in or come home, we would hear that voice. It was sort of all part of our consciousness. When I was a young broadcaster at a station which has now become a religious station, it was one of the early big talk stations in New York, right. Barry Gray was the king and the leader. Bob Grant was there already. I came in. I had young kids at the time, and Barry Gray taught me so many things, Jay, as he's taught all of us. He taught me, number one, to really know what you're talking about, to not be afraid, and to care about each and every person out there the way he cared. Take the chance, know what you're doing, and care. He was a giant, and we all learned from him. I used to be scared. You know, when you start out in this business and that great big voice yeah. and all that power. A titanic but voice. It was an incredible experience for me. I spent my early years in this business yeah. learning from him. And over the years, our paths, of course, have crossed many times. We've traveled together as families. I know many members of his family. I've become a good friend of his wife and celebrated with them the joy yeah. of this baby. And I know the joy it brought to all of them. So this is a great loss for the whole broadcast community and for the community at large. But you and I both know that wherever Barry is tonight, that big voice <laughs> is right. booming all he, over. That's right. He is a he is a part of my family. That was a nightly ritual for years and years. So help me, Joan, it was the first voice I learned to recognize every night eleven. And you know, speaking about that station, before they went talk, he was the only talk show. It was the biggest rock and roll station in town. And yet they stopped the rock and roll for him. For him. It's true. And he taught so many of us how to do it you know how to really take issues that you care about no question that he mentored more people in this industry and he made such a mark everyone i think no matter who they are knows who barry gray is what i always marveled at is that as barry grew older his mind grew sharper and sharper he never ever lost sight and one other tribute i i'm sorry to interrupt you joan he was a gentleman through and through and through in the classic tradition. Barry set an example on the air and off. Joan, I appreciate your coming tonight. I on thank WOR. you, Jay. 
We're going to miss him a lot, and we're all going to carry on knowing that he's watching each and every one of us. Uh, we better be on our best behavior. Take care. Okay, thank you. That's Bye. Joan Hamburg, ladies and gentlemen. This is Jay Diamond, a tribute to Barry Gray on WOR Radio 710. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is Bob Grant. When I first came to New York back in 1970 to join uh, the radio station WMCA, it uh, really wasn't uh, called WMCA out on the coast when we uh, talked about the radio station. I talked about uh, going to the radio station where Barry Gray broadcast. And uh, friends of mine uh, would say to me, Hey, Bob, I understand you're going to New York. You're going to work on the Barry Gray station. Barry, indeed, was a legend. Uh, whenever people talked about controversy on talk radio, whenever people talked about celebrity interviews, whenever people talked about taking a stand, no matter how unpopular that stand may be, the name Barry Gray was certainly to be heard. When I met uh, Barry in September of 1970, uh, I recall the warmth in which he greeted me, the genuine respect he uh, he had uh, not for me as a person because he didn't know me but for the reputation i had gained out on the west coast and i considered it a great honor that he welcomed me to the radio station and uh, that he was uh, only too happy to share with me any uh, knowledge he had of the city which as you may know was extensive Barry was born in uh, Los Angeles, but um, when he came to New York, he fell in love with it and never once really wanted to leave. This is where his profession was. This is where his work was. And above all, this is where his heart was. New York City. He loved everything about it. But most of all, I think he, he loved the the people, the people whom he had interviewed, countless, countless hundreds of people who uh, felt it a great honor to be a guest on the Barry Gray Show. And all I can say is it was an honor to have known him, to have worked with him, and to have him call me a friend. And so, uh, Barry Gray may be gone, but he leaves a legacy of great broadcasting and great times. Thank you. All right, this is Jay Diamond on WOR. We continue with our salute to Barry Gray, and we say hello to State Senator, Deputy Minority Leader David Patterson. Hello, David. Good evening, Jay. David, you were a regular with Barry for a long, long time. I think that's where I first got to know you, and I, I could always feel the real respect that you had for each other. You know, Jay, when I was about 12 or 13 years old, my father, who had been a state senator before me, right. took me to an affair, and we ran into a man named Norman Frank, who was the head of the Police Benevolent Association, or it may have been John Cassis, who was one of the two, and they were laughing and joking together, and I couldn't understand this because there had been a bitter battle over the Civilian Complaint Review Board in 1966, mm -hmm. and my father and Norman Frank had debated each other on the Barry Gray show, and it was, uh, you know, they obviously had different points of view. They were having such a good time together, and I said to my father, how do you know him? He says, uh, well, we became friends on the Barry Gray show. <laughs> and I, I think that's the real tribute that I would give to Barry mm -hmm. is that his radio program right. was really the mantle for political and social discussion around the city. Uh, people would come on, they would disagree, and I remember in one particular situation, I think it's the only time in my career when, when this happened to me, and oddly enough it was the same week that I got married, I became a little acrimonious with one of the other guests on the Barry Gray show over, <laughs> the, over the Crown Heights issue. Wouldn't have been the first time. <laughs> the, uh, yeah. Next day, yeah. Barry spoke to me, and he said, David, I'm not speaking to you as a talk show host. I'm speaking to you as a friend. He said, there are a lot of people out there who would really respect you, but you've got to understand other people's feelings and other people's points of view. 
Well, I never forgot that. I mean, it was just a terrific, uh, uh, you know, thing to do for a friend, which was how I considered Barry. And I guess I just have to tell you uh, on a lighter note, the last time I spoke to him was on the program he did for his birthday. And just as a little joke, because he was always asking me, I, I, let, my, my, I let my son say happy birthday to him. So we could always say that three generations of Patterson uh, have been on the Gary Gray show. Well, I think the the uh, sage advice he gave to you is reflected in the, the wisdom that he espoused to so many people. And you know something? His presence was so grand. His presence was so big in the studio, you wouldn't dare oppose him. And so I think that, that led to the cultivation of a friendly environment in the studio. My first <laughs> two appearances on his show were actually in the studio. He hadn't fully converted to doing the telephone interviews, which is, uh, you know, the more standard practice now. That's right. And uh, that presence had a lot, it, it kind of carried over. Right. I, I, <laughs> you're right. You know, David, that's so true because his original classic format was a coffee clutch. Exactly. With people in the studio. And I mean, it, if he weren't there to settle everybody down, it could have really become raucous. And, well, let me tell you, I could tell in his intonation. <laughs> when I was talking to him on the phone, when he was about to have had about enough with me, and uh, I remember one case, uh, Assemblyman Joe Lentall and I were debating, and he'd had about enough of the two of us, and I, I could feel that stare coming through the, uh, through the phone lines, and uh, I'm just going to miss him, and uh, I, I don't know if this is not uh, an interesting time in, in, uh, in your life, because uh, perhaps you'll be the beginning of a new tradition. Well, if I can hold to the tradition and the, the gentle grace that he uh, displayed on the air, then I will, I will really be, uh, well, fulfilling a very noble legacy. And, David, I feel Barry's presence staring at us right now because we're late for some spots. This is Jay Diamond on WOR, a tribute to Barry Gray. A rare find of the WOR radio family. We're joined by Tony Condemi and the Condemi Motor Company in Lodi, New Jersey, in sending you Holiday Town Broadway Notice the pitch of, of Barry's voice, faster speech pattern, but unmistakably, the great Barry Gray. And here he is, the man you won't want to miss, the hero and the villain of the Barry Gray Show and a new entertainment, with such guests as Vaughn Monroe, Olson and Johnson, and some resentful people of Teplitsky of Notre Dame. Meet the blaster of ceremonies, the pest of the guest, that rough old smoothie, Barry Gray on Broadway. Thank you, Ken Powell, and good evening, everyone. This is a new show called Barry Gray on Broadway, an audition type thing, and seated across the desk from me, I have Walter Gross, eminent pianist who has never appeared in Carnegie Hall. Walter and I are going to discuss such things as uh, plays on Broadway. We're going to talk a bit about the music business as regards piano players, 88 ticklers, and then we're going to talk a bit about the music business, USA, 1947. And here he is, Walter Gross. Good evening, Barry. I don't think the plays with messages are particularly successful when they make the message the uppermost thing. Well, uh... I, I think people shy away from messages in the theater. They go to be entertained. They don't go to be taught anything. Barry, you hit on the biggest point in playwriting just then. As it was so greatly expressed once by someone somewhere, he said, the only messages I want are from Western Union, and they only cost a quarter. I don't have to spend 440 to get them. Mm -hmm. You know, Walter, there are thousands of, of plays mm -hmm. waiting on shelves written by young, aspiring playwrights yes. that are truly great plays, and you can't produce them because no one will put money into them. But it's a well-known fact that if you come along with a show that, that has nothing but a very flimsy plot, maybe about a sailor chasing a girl in the park, and you have an opportunity for a 32-piece band to strike up a few bars of a tune that might make some I money. I like that. Anything that employs musicians, I'm for. And someone, someone that chases somebody through the park scantily clad, you immediately find a ready market for it, both from the backers and from the public, because mm -hmm. it's proven that people like to see girls with practically no clothes on. Well, what you have in play is, as your opinion, is just about like this. Uh, oh, you said about girls with no clothes on? Well, let's be careful. This is earlier in the evening than you're usually on, you know? And we get a slightly different type of audience. I think we'll change that. It's earlier in the evening than you are usually on. That's true. We have met before. Now we're going to say hi to somebody we all know here, WOR Radio 710 Program Director David Bernstein. David, 
Uh, did you ever think you'd end up as Barry Gray's boss? I can't believe that. Uh, no, I never <laughs> did, to be honest with you. I was, I was one of those kids who found the rock and roll station <laughs> and, and all of a sudden came to 11 o'clock at night, and lo and behold, the rock and roll was gone, and I started to panic until I heard that this guy, Barry Gray, whoever he is, <laughs> is talking about some pretty interesting... He's doing it in a style that I had never heard before. And it started to blow my mind. I became, I became a fan of this guy on the radio, and all the guys that I was a, a fan of were guys who played music. Yeah. So all of a sudden, it was Barry Gray came into my life, and he was there up until this week in life, and he will yeah. be with me forever. You know, David, I think you, you echo the sentiments of so many people listening in. He really will be with people forever. To have heard him once was to know him and to love him forever. He really was like a part of my home. He I was. He was a part of, of all of our homes, and he still is because of what he gave to the industry. He gave a style that nobody has been able to, uh, to imitate, uh -huh. and yet everybody understands, everybody listens to, and everybody tries to emulate. That's quite a position in society to have. I don't think he realized how important a man he really was. David, when you first met him in person, did you feel the, his star quality immediately? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You just looked up to this guy. He's about uh, close to a foot taller than me, and I just looked and up me. at this great man. <laughs> I just looked up at him, and he had this smile that had a, a wink in his eye as if we had been old friends. We had never met before. And I realized that there's a bond that's forming as we speak first time first conversation with him and this bond was forming and it culminated on this past monday uh, the day after i got a call from his wife nancy called me and mm -hmm. said if you'd like to come see barry in the hospital you have really one last chance uh -huh. and i went to the hospital on monday spent 20 minutes alone in the room with him barry was comatose and at the same time I found myself sitting next to him and whispering things in his ear that I'm surprised I was willing to share, yeah. but I was. Yeah. It was and at one point, yeah. Jay, at one point, Barry opened up his eyes mm -hmm. and his body started stirring. I had said something that, was, that, that meant a lot to me, and it was a very private thought. Mm -hmm. And I shared it with Barry, and he opened up his eyes. I know he heard what I said. Mm -hmm. Well, I would, um, let me make one quick suggestion to uh -huh. anybody who's listening, because I was there. Be tuned in at 7.50 tonight, because I know we're going to play the tape that I was fortunate enough to receive today of Barry Gray accepting the 1996 Talk Show Host oh, of the we, Year Award. we have that. Yes, you have it, and we'll air it at 7.50 tonight. Thank you, David. Thank glad, you, Jay. Glad to speak to you tonight. That was WOR's program director, David Bernstein. Now we go to Gary Ackerman, Congressman Gary Ackerman of Queens. Hello, Gary. Jay, how are you? Well, we're, we're doing well, but it is a, a kind of a, a solemn occasion tonight. I mean, I've heard you on so many times with Barry. Well, I'll tell you, we've, we've all lost a friend, and I think that uh, there are millions of people, especially all of New York, that's mourning right now for the loss of uh, an absolute... Uh, legendary pioneer of an industry a real institution you know uh, everybody has these when i was a kid stories uh, but i i really do i you know i was never very athletic and all of my friends for some reason were all athletic and i'd, I'd have this uh, small uh, transistor radio that i take down to the park when the kids were playing ball and i'd be on the sidelines and while everybody was uh, was running around and doing their thing i have the radio up to my ear and i i had a friend full time for the for the whole duration and i I learned so much from Barry, as, uh, as uh, just about everybody who's ever listened to him has. Uh, you know, he, he made the radio useful. The radio was around for a long time before Barry. Uh, but when you think about it, people would, wouldn't say, I'm going to go home and listen to the radio. They were going to ho go home and listen to Barry Gray. There was no voice that ever came through the radio that made me feel as comfortable and as secure as Barry Gray. It was, it was, you're absolutely right, Jay. There was, there was a kind of a, a warmth there. And he could, he could be tough, and he asked all the right questions. And, you know, some of these guys know a little bit about everything. He knew a lot about everything. And, uh, and he knew everyone. And he knew everyone. There wasn't That's one sure. person from politics or show business that that man didn't know and know well, and there wasn't one that didn't respect him. That's absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. And people would give their IT to be on with Barry. Very few people in, in radio can, uh, can bow out leaving that kind of reputation and that kind of legacy intact over such a long and prosperous and successful career. 
Thank you, Congressman Gary Ackerman. Now we visit Clark Logan for the fact. So many of Barry's friends and colleagues over the years loved and respected him to such an extent that we're hard-pressed to fit them all in tonight, but now we'll hear from Manhattan Borough President Ruth Messenger. This is Ruth Messenger, the Manhattan Borough President. I was absolutely stunned this weekend to read of Barry Gray's death. I think for everyone who has ever been on the program or knew Barry or had a chance to talk with Barry, and probably for everybody who ever listened to Barry, it was like losing a friend. Barry Gray was a brilliant master of the art of radio hosts. He just knew what to do to put people at ease. He knew exactly when to support a visitor and when to attack a visitor. He knew when to encourage a questioner. And in, 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 with an inimitable style, he knew when to hang up on a questioner. He must have been sort of like a um, juggler because he managed to keep several people's conversations in the air, several strands of conversation running through the program. And he knew so much, and he so much enjoyed people that he could do it all with great good grace. I consider myself privileged to have been Barry's guest many, many times. But I think every time I was his guest, it was really very much like sitting in his living room. He would open the conversation. He would make me and all callers feel relaxed. He would orchestrate the conversation. Never did we simply talk about one issue because Barry Gray knew everything about life in New York and had a phenomenal and ferocious memory and a great passion for this city. And so he would always move from topic to topic and talk about other issues and try to draw me out, and try to encourage guests to be uh, inquisitive and provocative, but never impolite. Uh, there just are not very many radio talk show hosts who are still doing programming, who have the elan and the verve and the passion for people that Barry Gray had. And I personally will miss him very much. And, you know, somehow I'll always be waiting for him to call again. Thank you, Ruth Messenger. This is Jay Diamond on WOR. And now, WOR's Ken and Daria Dolan. Daria, I will never forget meeting Barry Gray for the first time in 1986. Remember, remember we see you said a little gruff and, you know, boy, did we find out differently in the years since then. Well, you know, but it was more interesting than that because 1986, we were all working at uh, the old WMC together. Yeah. And uh, the Strauss family still owned it at the time. And that was my first time <laughs> on big time radio sure, of course. and the show that finished just in front of us was the barry gray show he was quite a character we used to go in as we do now with arthur schwartz uh remember Dari, we used to do a handoff just before the end of the show and barry was always yelling and screaming about something well and that was my first my first day on my first big job <laughs> in radio i was the one chosen to go in and to do the in. handoff yeah, that's right i have never been so frightened in my entire <laughs> life <laughs> And I never told Barry how scared I was, but it took me about three or four months before I got over the shock and fear of having to deal with Barry Gray. Well, I'll tell you, though, the 11 years since then, Barry, we have found him to be a very generous, a very warm fellow. Uh, he always had a joke, some of, which we could, some of which we could repeat on the air, many of which we could not. But, but that is a... the thing I think I yeah. remember most about Barry. Great Barry laugh. never, ever said hello without following it up with a punchline. <laughs> hey, Dolan, have you heard this one? Oh, my, here we go again. Remember the wonderful, we had a wonderful dinner at his home one night, Derek? Yes. How wonderful it was Nancy with, with Nancy. Cook, oh, it, was it, was super. it was right after they were first married. You know. And he was just so proud of her. He really was. Well, it's no secret that Barry certainly isn't a young guy. He's a he's a he's a the standard of talk radio. He really invented talk radio going back into the fifties and maybe even the forties. Remember the broadcast from Chandler's Daria. And in fact, we were out yeah. for dinner with some people the other night. Yeah. And uh, they're they're older than we are, and they were married. I think in the didn't they say the late fifties yeah. or the mid fifties or something? Mid -50s, yeah. And they used to date and go to Chandler's just to watch Barry Gray broadcast. Barry Gray from Ken and Daria, we certainly we miss you. Uh, you, thanks to you and others like you, but probably more to you than anybody else, help birth talk radio as we know it. We owe you a lot professionally. We owe you a lot personally, and we surely miss you. And I'll tell you one thing, Barry. I know you're up there broadcasting from Chandler's in the sky. God bless you. Rest in peace, Barry. 
Thank you, Ken and Daria Dolan. We're on WOR, and now we say hello to an old friend of Barry Gray, Paul Colford, who for many years wrote Newsday's radio column. And, Paul, you also filled in for Barry Gray a number of times. That's right. I was in the curious position of one who had uh, been on one side of the desk uh, interviewing Barry for Newsday any number of times in connection with the radio column. And for a variety of uh, unexpected reasons, found myself uh, pinch hitting for him on a number of nights in the summer of 1995 when he was sidelined uh, with what I recall to be a hip injury. So all of a sudden, the guy whom I had listened to and interviewed was now the guy listening to me. It was a very curious position to be in, but I, I, I developed a, a fondness for him that, that I, I certainly carry uh, to this day. He was supportive of me at the time. He was certainly, the, you know, uh, the class of classy people in, in the radio business. I, I think, um, Jay, one thing that uh, your, your guests uh, thus far are, are getting at, and I think it, it can't be overemphasized, is the fact that uh, you know, Barry never really phoned it in. I, I use it as a as a term of phrase. Uh, you may remember a couple years ago, the old Spy magazine had an issue on coasting, and they accused all kinds of public figures and actors and singers and so forth of coasting on reputations that were made years and years prior, and they hadn't done anything fresh, new, or different to really earn the respect that they started out with. Barry was different from that. He didn't really coast on any reputation uh, forged years and years ago. Each broadcast seemed to be his first. He was just as curious of, about the guest that he was having on tonight or tomorrow night as he was, uh, you know, talking about his, his role in the history of the business. And I think that speaks very highly of anybody who doesn't phone an engine and, 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 and interested in what they're doing in, in the present day. That's true. He, you know something? You, you make a good point, and it's something that, that I've noticed about some people on the radio. There is no coasting. Barry worked hard right up until the, the last day. Oh, absolutely. I think from, uh, I got a kick uh, off the air a number of times talking with uh, right. Marilyn Cutler, who uh, was Barry's uh, producer so faithfully in recent years, and she would talk about how, you know, the guest lineup, for example, would be set in stone, or so she thought, and at the last minute, Barry would decide for whatever journalistic reason that they should do it entirely differently, and back they were to the drawing board. So he was never... He was never content to just let it be. He was always looking for a way to keep it fresh, keep it interesting, keep it different. And, and you know, Paul, uh, this might be uh, visionary, but it, I think it, it bears saying. Paul, uh, you know, when ball players talk about salaries of the past, they talk about, well, what would DiMaggio have gotten today? What kind of a salary would Mickey Mantle command? My God, these guys would get $30 right. million dollars a year. Well, I'm going to tell you something. I think if Barry had been born 30 years later, they, he would have eclipsed Limbaugh and Stern put together. Yeah, it was, uh, it was interesting that Barry, for his longevity, certainly uh, outside of New York, probably didn't retain the kind of name recognition that uh, a Rush Limbaugh or, or many others today uh, have earned. But he seemed uh, almost indifferent to that. Well, no, but uh, there, he, he was there, so caught up, as I say, in, in doing the there, show tonight. There were no satellites then. Right. You see, if he had been born 30 years later, he would have had 1,500 stations. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's something to think about. Paul, thank you very much. It's nice to be with you, Jay. Thanks. Good to speak to you. And if, folks, if you want to participate in, in this impromptu tribute to Barry Gray, the number is 212-391-2800. 212-391-2800. Who knows? Maybe, maybe Barry will even hear you. Uh, I believe right now we go to, well, John Gambling. This is John Gambling, and it is always a, a difficult moment when we have to think of uh, one of our friends and one of our colleagues uh, has left us, and such the case uh, with Barry Gray. He is certainly going to be missed. Uh, he worked for a very long time and was a, an associate of not only this John, but uh, John A. and even John B. Gambling. A man has been in the broadcast industry for better than 50 years, earns a very special place. And I think if there is one thing that always impressed me about Barry Gray and working uh, opposite ends of the days generally, we didn't get to see each other a lot, but occasionally we would cross paths in the hall here at WOR. I was always impressed with the enthusiasm. Here was a man that for so many years went and did, well, pretty much the same thing, a talk show year in and year out. 
never lost the enthusiasm for what he was doing. And he always had, when listening to him on the air, he always had, uh, I think, an innate interest in other people. It didn't have to be a mayor, it didn't have to be a senator, it didn't have to be a newsmaker. Barry always was interested, even if it was just uh, a listener to Barry Gray that was calling with a comment. It's really quite something when you can run into somebody that uh, continues to show and respect those that uh, he is talking with the way Barry Gray did. He will certainly be missed here at WOR, and uh, for all of the gamblings, I know that we extend our warmest sympathies to his wife, Nancy, and to the entire Gray family. He will be missed. He sure will. He sure will, John. And this is Jay Diamond on WOR, our tribute, our homage to, well, our founder, really, in this business, Barry Gray, and now we'll hear from Dr. Joan. The first time I met Barry Gray, neither of us worked for WOR. I was in town to do a book tour, and we were using a studio at another radio station, and Barry Gray walked in the room. He was tall and elegant and angry, uh, which to a very large extent describes a lot about Barry Gray. He was not an easy man. Um, he was very bright. He always looked fabulous, even when he was in a jogging suit. He always put a scarf or a handkerchief or something around his neck, so he looked both elegant and, for those of us who are in broadcasting, you know, protect the pipes. But he's really the guy who started talk radio. A bunch of years later, when I ended up at WOR, he was really one of the first people I ran into when I once I was officially hired because we both worked the night shift. And uh, I went in to say hello to him, and uh, he welcomed me aboard and between yelling at his producer and told me that it was great fun to work nights and it was a great old station and started reminiscing about the other stations he'd worked for all over the country. So he would actually listen to my program going home in the cab and then he and Nancy would have dinner together and listen to my program. So every night he would kind of critique the night before and he would tell me his favorite call and, uh, and what he thought I did a particularly good job of. So he was very, very supportive and uh, really mentored me in, in a wonderful way when I started WOR. And then I got uh, shifted to Days. And he was kind of the proud papa that was both very proud of me and furious with me for deserting him and uh, made no bones about it, although he wasn't angry enough not to tell me the secret when he and Nancy were preparing to adopt Dora. Um, and Barry got named Broadcaster of the Year, a Lifetime Achievement Award for the National Association of Radio Talk Show Hosts. And I was determined that I was going to go to Washington and watch him get that honor because um, he's not, as I said before, the world's easiest man to deal with, but there was an integrity about Barry and a strength about Barry and an energy about Barry, who was obviously not a young man even when I knew him. And it was one of those moments that um, I will be grateful that I had the sense to, to put myself in the way of my whole life because he was charming and wonderful, and, and he really gave me the history um, to the work that I do, as well as the other several hundred people who were there to honor him. And then this incredibly magical thing happened to me in that I got a completely unexpected award as well, and he was on the dais beaming at me. and threw his arms around me and said, good going, kid. And the fact that it was really his day and I got a little, a little piece of it made it particularly special. So um, Barry was angry his whole life. Um, he was angry at injustice. He was angry at the way things should be and weren't. Um, he was angry, I think, because this business that he began went in a direction of which he did not always approve. But he was always angry without malice. There was never an, att an attempt to hurt or harm someone. And when, he, when his anger did hurt sometimes, which it did to me occasionally, and he realized it, he would apologize. Uh, there was no malice in the man. There was no attempt to hurt. There was certainly an attempt to change, to, to make people better. Uh, he, I think in, in the last several years, he was angry at his own body, which was not responding the way he wanted to, and it caused him literally great pain. But um, I... And when I remember Barry, um, and I shall, um, will always remember the elegance, um, the strength, the energy, and the anger, because that's part of, of who Barry was and, and certainly will continue to be in my head and my heart. But, Barry, I'm, I'm going to miss you. Thank you, Dr. Joy Brown. For those of you who do not know, the, uh, the great Barry Gray succumbed 
1 a.m. Saturday morning, and this is our homage to our friend, our teacher, and, uh, well, our relative, Barry Gray, and certainly the father of this business. This is Jay Diamond on Radio 710 WOR, and right now we're hearing from many of Barry's friends and colleagues, and we have a good one here. Guy Molinari, the borough president of Staten Island. Hello, Guy. Good evening, Jay. Well, you were on with Barry so many times. Yes, indeed. So, so many times. How far did you go back with him? Oh, God. I, I guess as long as I've been in uh, the political world, and that's over 20 years, uh, I can't remember the first time I appeared on his program, but uh, I was stunned. I did not know that Barry was sick or that he passed away until late this afternoon. And I guess I'm still a little bit of shock because... Uh, he was just such a profound in character. I mean, this was a man that was New York. Uh, he was a voice um, for those of us that uh, sometimes thought we were in the minority and we had views that we wanted to express. And, and uh, he gave us an opportunity frequently uh, to, to give our side of the, the story. And sometimes those of us that call ourselves Republicans uh, didn't have that opportunity frequently. Barry always extended it to us. And, and, uh, and not that Barry was a committed Republican. Oh, no, heavens no. It was just that he was a fair that's right. journalist, and he wanted to have both sides covered fairly, and he always did. And, and I guess that's why I respected him so much. Uh, it's just a terrible loss uh, for everybody, but um, especially for New Yorkers. Uh, it's a voice that uh, was a strong voice, a voice that everybody heard. Um, most people listened to him, and it's sad to know that that voice is quiet now. Well, it's the, it's the passing of an age. You bet. It really is. Yep. It's a it's a it's a tectonic plate just shifting off. It's well, it's difficult to 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 it's difficult to express the impact this man had on two generations of not only political life but cultural life in our yeah. city. Very good point. Very good point. And uh, you know, it is it's difficult to express in words. Really, what uh, we all felt about Barry. Uh, he was just an extraordinary person, and I think he set a standard for just about everybody, whether we're talking about radio um, or those of us in elective life. Uh, he taught fairness, he preached fairness, he practiced fairness, and, uh, and he expected fairness from everybody, and he gave it. You know, a lot of you guys who run for office are lucky Barry never decided to run against you guys. <laughs> you know that? Well, he would have been a, wouldn't he have been a formidable oh opponent? Oh, my God, yes, he would have. Uh, he would have, <laughs> I sure as heck am happy he never chose to run against me because uh, that would have been difficult. Uh, he, had, uh, he had a big following. Uh, yeah. And uh, fine man, you know, just a fine man. It was just such a terrible loss. And, but I, I say this, Jay, um, uh, I pay tribute to you and the others who are taking time out tonight to talk about Barry and what he was all about. I think it's a marvelous thing, and I think we owe it to the man, and uh, I'm certainly delighted to, not delighted, but uh, be able to have the opportunity to share with the listeners uh, the tremendous loss I feel. Thank you. Thank you, Guy. I really appreciate it. Borough President of Staten Island, Guy Molinari, and now I think we have a, a legendary Barry Gray guest. Do we have the ambassador? Are we ready? You know, Ambassador, I've never met you, I've never spoken to you, but I, I can't call you anything else than Bill, <laughs> well, from having you. heard you with Barry all through the years. <laughs> it was Bill, 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 so forgive me, Bill. No, that's what it is, and that's what it was for 40 years with Barry. Actually, we went back literally 40 years. It began with the Hungarian Revolution, and although I see the newspapers have Barry identified primarily at uh, that restaurant at 46th Street in Manhattan, I remember him in Brooklyn, and he had a radio show from there, and I had been with General Donovan and the International Rescue Committee in, during the Hungarian Revolution. And when we came back, uh, Barry was, you know, very passionate about it, very passionate about helping the freedom fighters. And so I was invited to go on his program, and that began a relationship that literally has lasted 40 years, and which has given me the enormous pleasure and honor of being with him for hours and hours right. and hours on this program. Many of which I enjoyed and, and benefited you. from. I Thank learned you. from the two of you talking to each other. You, so you were in the studio with him that first night in 56. Yes. yes. Well, I, I, as I recall it, uh, it, it was, a, it was a, one of those great restaurants in Brooklyn, and there was a piano play, and he had a lot of entertainers who came by. Mm. It, wasn't in, it, it was really in the restaurant itself. And then on 46th Street, I think, it was also directly in the restaurant because I remember a number of entertainers coming by then. 
then in in i suppose the last 30 years it was in the studios so it started in the restaurant started then. in the restaurant well certainly by the time the 1964 campaign that was in the studio that was in the studio and that was with robert kennedy and right. and barry played a, a, an incredibly interesting and important role in that campaign what did he do well, it was Robert Kennedy running against the incumbent Senator Kenneth Keating, right. and it was a very tough uh, and confrontational race. And uh, Robert Kennedy uh, had just been overwhelmed by uh, crowds that no one had ever seen before in terms of uh, the political campaigns in New York, wherever he went. But part of that problem was that it cost him the ability to give his message. So by the time the beginning of October 64 came around, the race was very close. And Keating, sensing his possible advantage, uh, challenged Kennedy uh, uh, to a debate. Well, Kennedy was prepared to do that, but then Keating, instead of that, said no, that he was, he was going to... Kennedy thought that it would be a mistake tactically to go in at that particular time. Mm. So Keating went into the studio at CBS and had a half hour program that he was invited Kennedy to remember that music and it's sad because right after that music sounds we're accustomed to hearing Barry Gray and as I said to to Bob Grant a couple of weeks ago you might not have been interested in the specific subject but you wanted that man in your home night after night after night after night that was his magic that was his grace that's what made this man not just a radio broadcaster that's what made Barry Gray an enduring presence, an enduring star. Very, very few people have that, ladies and gentlemen. Believe me, I know. Barry Gray was and remains unique. He had a magic, a gift. It's called stardom. And right now, a very special guest, Nancy Gray, Mrs. Barry Gray. Hello, Nancy. Hi, Jay. I really just called to thank you for all of this. I didn't expect to be on the air at all, but I'm... I'm just so grateful to you and Marilyn and David and everybody who's put this together because Barry was so proud of what he did and we miss him so much and I'm just very, very grateful. Uh, how is how is the lovely Dora? Because she, she was is, the pride and joy of Barry <laughs> in the last couple of years. She is just wonderful. She had a she had a really incredible visit with Barry at the hospital. I was so happy that she could uh. see him at the hospital. She's about 27 months now. And um, I told her a little bit about what to expect, and she said, um, I'm going to give Dad a Tylenol and kiss his boo-boo. Oh, my and they, God. They had a wonderful, wonderful visit um, about a week ago. Well, Nancy, uh, you know, so many people, listeners, are trying to call through. We don't have time to put too many of them on the air tonight, but we'll try to take some more calls. But I think during the week on, on some of the other programs as well and uh, on a lot of the local hours here on Radio 710 WOR, we are going to hear from people and their outpouring of, of love uh, for Barry and their, their love really for that little girl that you had together, Dora. And I, I know from having listened to him, and I'm going to tell you something, I was on, Nancy, <laughs> I was on another radio station later at night and in getting ready to go to the office every night, what do you think I did? I listened to Barry Gray, so help me. Aww. And I'm going to tell you something. I, I pilfered a couple of guests from Barry because of, the riveting, man, because of the riveting programs that I heard him do while I was getting dressed. I had, it on in the, I had it on in my room, and I had it on when I was shaving or brushing my teeth. Getting ready, I listened to Barry Gray every night as I, as I had for years and years and years going back to, to my home with my parents. And I can tell you that, that I will feel the loss in, in my, myself. And you want to know something? Sitting there the last couple of weeks and, and doing Barry's show, I said on the radio, and I said it to people around here, I miss listening to Barry. I know it. That enormous, titanic, magnificent presence and voice was something that was my companion at home alone in my apartment. It's true. And I think, you know, sometimes when he'd come home from work, and I listened to the show just about every night, uh, he'd say, is it, is it funny listening to me on the air, meaning listening to your husband on the air? And I said, no, it's not, because I'm listening to Barry Gray. It, it, it was as if, you know, he, he is bigger than life, and he was a presence that... A star. 
I don't think he considered himself one, but he... The biggest. But I did. <laughs> the biggest. I the did. biggest. And, and you know, Jay, what you touched on and some of the other people that is so meaningful to me is the fact that he did do every broadcast as if it was the first. And that was very, very important to him. He right, he worked hard. Of doing it, right. Never got bored. Nancy, please stay with me. We have Mayor Rudolph Giuliani. Oh, stay there. Mr. Mayor? Hello, Jay. How are you? Good, Mr. Mayor. How are you? Nancy? Hi, how are you, Rudy? I, I want to express to you, uh, you know, the sympathy and the condolences and the prayers and, of everybody in the city. And Barry, I, Barry was a great, great New Yorker, one of the very best. Thank you, and I, and your letter to him in the hospital meant so much to him. He was very, very proud of that, and let everybody know. Well, I, I was listening to, uh, to the show a little bit before, uh, before I called in, and very much like Jay, I used to listen to Barry all the time. Going back to the 50s and the 60s, and I remember his interviews. Uh, I, probably a lot of my knowledge and interest in politics comes from listening to Barry, so he was a real hero. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, I, I think, Mr. Mayor, one thing we can, we can really agree on is that Barry's show was an, a really open format where issues could be debated, and he provided the kind of ambiance that made people comfortable speaking and comfortable speaking to people who even who, that opposed them. There's no question about it. No matter what issue it was, right. whether he agreed with you That's or disagreed right. with you, he gave you a fair chance. And he was o always had so much common sense. I mean, you could really uh, get an awful lot out of listening to him. Yeah, whether it was politics, art, culture, economics, or history, Barry made a commitment to doing that program every night. I really think you could tell, and maybe you'll agree, uh, coming from the legal world, uh, your training is as an attorney, I think you will agree that that Barry cultivated an environment where opposing ideas could be aired and aired comfortably. And I think it's important when people feel comfortable if they want to really open their hearts. There's absolutely no question about it. Uh, and he helped to uplift the city, educate people in the city. I remember way, way back when uh, I remember the, the congressional race between uh, Mike Seymour and then uh, Ed Koch when he ran the first time for... Uh, <laughs> when he ran the first time for Congress, and it was on Barry's show that they did their debates. And it was one of my early uh, uh, involvement in New York politics, listening to those debates. It was just absolutely terrific, and he gave both of them uh, a real chance. Nancy? Yes. Nancy, in, in uh, watching Barry prepare for the program, uh, what made an impression on you? Did he work strenuously at home? I think that what made an impression on me was, uh, first of all, he was a speed reader. I'd ask him to read an article. He'd look at it for 30 seconds. and I'd say, no, read it. He said, I did. Ask me anything about the article. Hmm. And the other thing was that he was always, he was always working, but it was such a joy for him that it wasn't work. He would be listening to other radio shows. He would be watching the TV news. He would read four or five newspapers every day. He'd read every major periodical. And... He was, as he put it, an information junkie or an information maven. He just, he loved what he did so much that every minute was working, Ma but it wasn't. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, are you there? I'm right here. Uh, Mr. Mayor, in, uh, in listening to what Nancy said, w w would you say, that if all, and then, I'm not going to put you on the spot, but I, in listening to Barry, I cannot encounter him the way, way somebody running for office or would encounter him. But in terms of your own campaigns, in terms of issues that you've discussed with him, and let's face it, you've been on the air with me, you've been on the, the air with Bob, you've been on the air with many people. I seem to feel that you, as well as many other people in political life, opened up a bit more to Barry. I think Barry uh, set the standard for your, for your profession, for your business. And I think uh, all of you sort of uh, learned a lot from him. And the fact is, I learned a lot from him. And there's no question, when he interviewed you, he would somehow get more out of you. Yeah. He also was just a wonderful man, and I have to say he was also a very good friend. Well, a Ma really good friend. Mr. Mayor, I appreciate your coming to the and microphone tonight. I miss him tonight. a lot. Uh, Nancy, I really miss him a lot. Thank you so much. And the whole city does, and uh, I just think it's wonderful, because I think he set the standard for this whole new avenue of debate, discussion, and when it's done right, it really advances our democracy. You okay. Did. Thank you, Rudolph Thank you. Giuliani, Mayor of New York. Appreciate your coming tonight. Nancy? Yes. Um, Let me get off the air, Jay. No, 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 no. Before you go, <laughs> before you go, I really, no, I want to thank you for being here. 
But I, I want to ask, I, I don't know if this is how did when did you first meet Barry? We met in 1983. Uh huh. We met through mutual friends who asked that he had recently separated from his wife, and we uh, these these friends said, uh, why don't you call him up and ask him out for a drink? And uh, I said, no. I, I had grown up listening to Barry, too. Yeah. I said, I'm sure what this man needs right now is some strange woman calling him up and saying, hey, let's go out for a drink. And they would not get off my back about this. So mm. Our friends were in and Barbara. And uh, finally, I thought, well, I'll just call him. He'll say no, and that'll be that. So I called him up, and he said yes. And uh, that was in 1983. We met at the Ginger Man mm. and uh, had drinks. And... Unbeknownst to him, uh, I knew he had opening night tickets to American Ballet Theater. And uh, my friends had, had leaked that information to me. So uh, he, after the drink, said, would you like to have some dinner? And I said, oh, that would be lovely. And he then said that was the most ridiculous question I ever asked of, of me because I'm definitely a good eater. And uh, then later on in the dinner, he said, would you like to go to the American Ballet Theater? And I said, would I like to go to the American Ballet Theater? So we proceeded across the street to Lincoln Center. We had uh, seats on the aisle, center aisle, about 10 rows back. And we sat down and I said, is this the best you can do? <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. We fell in love, I think, that moment. That's, well, I, it was clear to anybody who listened how devoted he was to you and, and your little girl. Thank you. And I'm honored that you, you came on the air with me tonight. and. Let's, uh, let's hear more from you as well. All right, thank you so much, Jay. Thank you, Nancy. Again, I thank everybody at WOR, such good friends, and I think more than anything, the listeners were and are so important to all of us, and I, I thank them too. Thank you, Nancy. Thanks. That's Nancy Gray, Mrs. Barry Gray, and I'm sure your prayers go to her and that lovely little baby, Dora. This is Jay Diamond, WOR, uh, our, our homage, our tribute, our thank you to our friend, our mentor, Barry Gray. And stay with us. At 7.45, we have a special segment. You will hear Barry Gray accepting the Talk Show Host of the Year Award in Washington, D.C., just this past summer. I believe it was in July. Right we now, return to WOR, and we an old Barry Gray friend, Staten Island City Councilman Vito Fasella. Hello, Vito. Hello, Jay. How are you tonight? Well... We're, we're as good as we could be because yes. we've all lost somebody we've known for a long, long time. Yes. Somebody who's really become part of our homes. I don't think there's anybody I've had in my house, now that I think of it, Vito, longer than Barry. My, my parents are long gone, mm. but Barry is, was still here right up until, well, a couple of months ago. Well, it is, a, it is a big loss for the city, and let me offer publicly my condolences and prayers to, uh, to Nancy and, and her family at this time, particularly around the holiday, makes it even more difficult, and there's no question the city has lost a, a pillar of the community, and um, I have uh, both personal um, experiences with Barry, and, and he made me feel uh, like something special, as he did to all his guests and callers, and I will never forget it, what a gentleman he was and the connection that we made. Um, and it was something truly special. And at first, I was in awe that I was even given the privilege and opportunity to be on his show. Um, and here I am uh, being asked by him if I'd be willing to take callers, etc. And I said, wait a minute, you're the boss. You're Mr. Gray. You make the calls on this. And, uh, but there's something truly special. And uh, if anything, uh, he provided a forum uh, to, for open communications and dialogue, freedom of speech, that this country uh, truly cherishes, and I think he made this city and country a truly a very special and a better place. And he, he kept you guys honest, too. Uh, he certainly did. Uh, there was no, no question about it when you were on his show as a guest that uh, you were going to slip one by Barry Gray. Uh, he challenged <laughs> you, and um, he made me a better person, I believe. And uh, I'm a fan of uh, Mark Twain, and I was trying to find a little quip that was appropriate uh, to describe this in some small way, and it goes something like this. It, it, it is by the goodness of God that in our country we have those three unspeakably precious things, freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, and the prudence never to practice either of them. And fortunately, Barry Gray uh, had such a uh, devotion to freedom of speech and to freedom of conscience, and um, he, he exercised them. And 
again, he made me a better person. I think he made the city a better place. Sir. Vito, I'm really grateful you, you helped us out tonight and uh, visited with us and, and reflected on Barry. And I think your words are, are wise and meaningful. Forgive me for running. We have so much to do and really very tight space in which to fit it all in. Right now, we'll hear from some more members of the WOR family about Barry Gray. Hi, this is Arthur Schwartz, and I'm very sad to have to do this, but Barry Gray, we've lost Barry Gray. We're all very sad about that at WOR. He was, of course, one of America's great all-time broadcasters, and I'm very, very thrilled and honored to say that I was connected with Barry Gray at the very beginning of my radio career, which started in about 1979 when I went to work at the New York Daily News. That was right after the 1978 newspaper strike. And during that strike, a bunch of Daily News reporters and editors got together to do a, a radio show so that they could keep up with their beats, you know, so the City Hall reporter would still know what was happening at City Hall at the end of the strike, even though he didn't have to work, at least wasn't getting paid for it. So they all went on the air doing this, what they called the Bulldog Edition, which was they used to call the uh, first edition of the Daily News, the edition that came out with the racing results early in the evening, uh, the day before the date on the paper. So the Bulldog Edition was, was actually um, broadcast from the New York Daily News building on 42nd Street. We had an auditorium in the building at the time. And sure enough, Barry Gray was the host of that show. I can't tell you how much the man taught me. It was, there were memorable days. Um, you know, he, would, he was the one who taught me to be natural on the air, to just, you know, you're just talking to your friends, Arthur. You're just telling us what it's about, Arthur. He was always most respectful towards me, even though I was just a young whippersnapper and he was the grand old man of radio. But really, we're going to miss Barry terribly, terribly, terribly. And I'm sure you all will, too, because he truly was one of the greatest broadcasters of all time. Thank you, Arthur Schwartz. This is Jay Diamond on WOR. Our thank you, our tribute, our goodbye, but not really a goodbye, our remembrance of a real friend, Barry Gray. Well, uh, now I don't think there's any greater chronicler of Broadway lore, of entertainment, cultural history than the man I'm about to introduce. I'm going to talk to Joe Franklin. Jay, uh, as you might know, because I heard you say that you're an old or young Joe Franklin watcher, I would say that from right. 1951 to about 1994, Barry Gray was a guest on my TV program maybe 55 times, maybe 60 times, and it was pure friendship, Jay. There was no money, there was no payment. Right. Barry had nothing to plug. Only once, I think twice, he came on to promote a book that he had written, but all the other times, he came on the Joe Franklin Show, first on Channel 7, then on Channel 9, just to chat, just to chew the fat. And I just want to say, apropos of what, what Nancy said, he was so bright, the man was so apt, he was so glib, such a quick study, or, you know, such a fast read that he actually preferred interviewing the author of a book, and it could be a, a profound book, could be a, a complicated subject, without reading the book. Maybe maybe just a glance at the book jacket, but there's, he was so quick. And Barry's line of questioning, Jay, as you know, had point, it had edge, it had bite. His, his questions were what they used to call, you know, at a time when radio interviewing was very bland, he was the first one to get really investigative and hard-hitting and probing and penetrating and we were friendly i just want to say in conclusion i know you're tight that barry gray and i were so close we were so friendly to the extent that we used to exchange guests i mean i would get him otto preminger i'd get him georgie jessel <laughs> sally kirkland captain lou albano <laughs> jimmy Durante, and then in return like like a like a swap shop like a like a barter plan he would get me uh, jim uh, jimmy carter bella abzug and of course he'd get me himself and uh, and, you know, he began on this radio stage. He began as a staff announcer uh, yeah. introducing Uncle Don. Remember the name Uncle Don? I do indeed. Henry Morgan, the big band remotes. And he, he yeah. was, you know... Joe, was, you're making a good point. Barry was a real Broadway hand. He was. Like Damon Runyon. He was. And no matter where he went in between, he loved... He loved 710. That was his lucky number on the dial, 710. And I, I think he was the best of his kind. I think what you're doing tonight is so beautiful. And I'm going to miss... I mean, this man is very hard to replace. And I'm going to miss the very colorful... You know, I used to kid him that his name is Gray. But he certainly wasn't Gray. He was very colorful, Mr. Gray. And, and he was... Uh, I mean, he was... He was I think the most envious moment of my whole life, Jay, was, was listening to Barry Gray interviewing Al Jolson. Oh, my head. Remember that for three hours overnight on WOR, although i got to admit, I was a teenager then, I, I was not yet in broadcasting, but Al Jolson was my idol, and to hear, uh, I was tuned in there so jealous, and when Jolson sang for three hours with mm. Barry, I was, I, was, I was just, you know, very jealous, but he was... Uh, Someday I'll have to listen to you, you'll have to play me that tape of you and Cantor. Eddie, oh yeah, Eddie Cantor with me, and, but, but, uh, but I can tell you that 
my love to Nancy. I mean, the, the Barry Gray's uh, candor, you know, his, his acid comment it would alienate the way some people said tonight, but it would incur disagreement or bitterness, but, but, but any kind of resentment, any grudge, it was so short-lived, Jay, because the, everybody Thank admired you. the man for his... Uh, he, he would stimulate the mind. He, was, he had perceptive criticism, and, and anybody that was ever upset by Barry, they, they loved him at the same time. Thank you, Joe, and God bless you. That's Joe Franklin heard here Saturday night overnight right here on Radio 710 WOR. Don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, we're, we're talking about Barry Gray all week. This is not just tonight, so Mike Siegel does it tonight at midnight, filling in for Joey Reynolds, and make certain at 745 you're perched in front of the Red Bull. We will hear Barry's acceptance speech from this past July in Washington, D.C., when he accepted the award as radio talk show host of the year. We might say maybe the century. This is Jay Diamond on WOR Radio 710. Barry Gray was very very special not only to myself but also to my entire community uh, he was someone the experiences the many experiences that I had with him on the air was someone who stood up for what he believed in regardless of how popular the cause was at that particular moment and he never gave up if he believed in something he fought and fought and fought and uh, that was my experience with him again and again there were times when he and I disagreed on issues, but I think the thing that was so special about Barry Gray was the way he handled people, his kindness, his sweetness. There was something else about Barry Gray that was special that, unfortunately, there aren't any words that I can find to describe that very, very special quality about people. Barry Gray had that very special quality I've done many, many programs, many, many interviews, but Barry Gray was in a league all by himself. There hasn't been anyone like Barry Gray, and I don't think there will ever be anyone that had that special, special quality that Barry had for so many years with hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. He was really special. We will all miss him. And that was Brooklyn Assemblyman Dove Hikend. This is Jay Diamond on WOR celebrating the life and work of Barry Gray. We'll be right back. This is Warren Eckstein. I'd like to send out my condolences to the family of Barry Gray. Uh, you know, I've known Barry for many, many years when, uh, as part of the WOR family, and even prior to the WOR family, one of the first radio shows I ever did was with Barry, and I found him to be a fair but tough interviewer, and uh, he will be missed in the New York, uh, in the New York area. A true man, Barry. Um, a lot of respect for him. He taught me a lot about broadcasting, and he will be missed as part of the WOR family. Uh, however, I know wherever Barry is right now, he's sitting in front of a microphone. I'm Ralph Snodsmith, host of the Garden Hotline, heard here on WOR Radio, wishing to express my condolences to the family of Barry Gray, a real professional from both behind the microphone and in person. Barry was always able to provide a balance when doing his program, whether the subject matter was personal, private, public, liberal, or conservative. Having been a caller to Barry's program, I was made to feel welcome, even though I did not agree with his guest's liberal bias. Barry possessed the attributes of managing his guests and callers' viewpoint without prejudice, an ability missing in many talk show hosts today. Barry Gray, it's been a pleasure to have known you as a professional, as a friend, and as a member of the WOR family. You will be missed. Well, it... And uh, we may yet be able to say hello to all of them, but I... I will thank them all, but I, I want you to know that this is really incredible that it would come down to me to do this show reflecting on Barry Gray, and in a way I suppose it's fitting because I'm going to reiterate, restate what I've said all through the night. This man, when I come to think of it, has been with me longer than my father and mother, in my house every night, really living with me sharing sorrows, sharing frustrations with me, sharing joy, sharing happiness, and sharing my life. And through it all, he was a, uh, a wiser, older, stronger, smarter presence 
than I was in my own home. But he was always there, night in and night out. Barry Gray was part of all of our lives. And as I said, that voice coming out of the radio provided a security, an assurance, a, a happiness, a companion that you honestly could feel in your own home. Barry Gray made an apartment into a home. That was his magical presence. Barry Gray cared about you. Barry Gray mattered to you, and you mattered to him. That was his genius. That was his craft. That was his art. God bless you, Barry. And in his own words now, we go to Barry Gray. When I was uh, apprised of the fact that Barry Gray was to be the nominee for this award, I asked that I have this privilege. Last year, uh, it, the way it works is that the guy you got up the year before gives it, well, you don't think Rush is going to come here to give an award. He didn't come to get his own. And if you remember, those of you who were here, I took that occasion to pick on one of our congressmen, which is a whole other program. But in any event, I asked if I could have this honor. Uh, I have known Barry longer than he has known me. When I was quite young, my father called Barry Gray, Barry Pink. He uh, didn't like his politics, but what he liked less was the fact that my mother would listen to him in the middle of the night, depriving the old man of sleep. And I think my father must have taken at least one or two turns in his grave because now his, his kid is doing the same thing that Barry did, keeping women awake at night to the consternation of their husbands, which is another program. I first met Barry uh, in 1978. I asked him if he remembered, and of course he did not, and that's understandable. That was when I first began with WMCA in New York. Ellen Strauss, uh, a very imperious woman who was very good to me, was running the station. Her husband was running Voice America here in Washington. And the station was sponsoring a premiere of one of the worst movies I have ever had the privilege to see. George C. Scott playing two roles. It was absolutely awful. But of course, the, they gave tickets out on the air and that sort of thing. Well, they introduced the various talent. It took about, oh, I think two and a half seconds to get me out of the way. And maybe 10 seconds to get Sally Jesse Raphael out of the way. But then we got to Mrs. Strauss's star, and that was Barry Gray. And she went on about Mr. Gray for some time, and he made an entrance that I have not forgotten, because he carried himself well, he was dressed absolutely perfectly, the crease in his slacks with a slice of roast beef. And Barry made an entrance. But you know, at the end of this thing, unlike one or two people I had occasion to talk to last night, he stopped and talked to me. You know, I'm a nobody from nowhere, this guy from New Jersey doing an afternoon show never would ever heard of, but he took five minutes to talk to me about what he thought I ought to be doing. And that's the difference between class and crass. And I think you know who I'm talking about. Barry has been doing this talk thing for more years than he may want to admit to and I'm going to talk about. He did a talk show, I believe, in Chandler's Restaurant, where he repeated the conversations of the caller, if you can believe so. Hello, this is Harry. Right, isn't it? Before Chandler's. Before they had the delay, which uh, John Nebel uh, takes the credit for inventor, took the credit for inventing. In any event, he spent many years at WMCA in New York. He is now with 50,000 watts of power in New York City, WOR, doing what he does best, chatting with his audience. It is a joy and a genuine pleasure and indeed an honor to present one of the true icons of our industry, Barry Gray. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I normally, I'm using a cane because, uh, as I told June Lockhart earlier, I fell down some stairs and broke a couple of hips. How's that for an opener? I have known Bruce a very long time with Joy and Gene Burns and these very distinguished people. 
The broadcast actually began in 1945. Yeah, 51 years ago. And uh, it started on WOR. I had just come out of the Army, and there was a fellow by the name of um, Steve Ellis who was doing an all-night program called Moonlight Saving Time. That's what it was called. Records, conversation, and uh, those were the days of Rosie the Riveter, and they were busily spinning records for those women from 2 until 5.45 in the morning. And uh, he got fired because in the middle of the night he had a habit. I was a staff announcer. He had a habit of putting on a record and going down the, stu down the hall about three studios, and he would take with him a young lady. They used to call them B-girls. They were trying to do it for victory. <laughs> and... Steve would go down the hall, and the record got stuck. And it got stuck for about 12 minutes, and they fired him. Because, to top it all off, he denied that it ever happened. Who are you going to believe, me or your own eyes? <laughs> At any rate, on the way out, he said, by the way, you've got this kid, Barry Gray, and I was a kid. <clears throat> you got this kid that does remotes. I think he'd be good for the all-night thing. And so I went to work, working nights, spinning the records, and after about... Two days of that, I got bored. I had worked with Vaughn Monroe and Guy Lombardo and Sammy Kay, et cetera, et cetera. And I started to tell stories about what it was like to work for those, guy those guys. And boy, I tell you, that, that could take a week. And uh, the talk got longer, and the records got shorter. And one night, the phone rang. I didn't hear a ring, of course, but we had a light that was behind the glass in the control room. The light went on and I said to the audience, I said, there's some schmo on the air. That was a big word in those days. There's some schmo on the air. And I picked up the phone and I said, hello, and it was Woody Herman. <laughs> and we talked for a moment or two. I'd been his announcer. We talked for a moment or two and I hung up. And two more calls and three more and 10 more all wanting to know if that was really Woody Herman. And that's how the talk show began. I suddenly realized that people wanted to hear me talk to listeners, talk to them, than any record I could play. And so the talk got longer and longer, and pretty soon it was an all-talk show. And you can say for the record, it was born in 1945 on WOR. Right. <laughs> Thank you. And who was it that said, God, what they have wrought? Today, you go, I, I drove across the country some time ago, and there was a guy working at a chicken restaurant, <clears throat> broadcasting at a window, wearing a cowboy outfit, I mean boots and chaps and hat and the works, and they were selling chickens, and he was doing a talk show. And I thought...